Okay, hello and welcome everyone. So in this video, I'm going to do I'm going to do a walkthrough of Bertrand price competition specifically for identical products Bertrand. Differentiated products Bertrand is a completely different animal entirely, but we're going to talk about identical products Bertrand, which is often built into a lot of different types of models like a hoteling model, like the linear city or stuff like that. And in a lot of cases, I suppose that when people are introduced to Bertrand equilibria or Bertrand Bertrand model, this is the version that they would see, and this would be the type of equilibria they'd be solving for. And so I've got my assumption here for Bertrand price competition. We're assuming identical products. That's very key. If we have product differentiation, it's a different model entirely. And actually, the analysis looks a lot like Corneau oligopoly in terms of in terms of how you'd set up the problem. It's just that you're going to set up the profit function in terms of uh, price rather than in terms of quantity. Well, anyway, but for identical products, Bertrand, assume that we have uh, we have uh, marginal cost curves for two firms. So we're thinking of a duopoly. Marginal cost curves, I'll, or marginal cost, I'll assume is 200 for each firm. And it turns out the Nash equilibrium is going to be set price equal to marginal cost, set price equal to 200. And so why is this the case? Well, uh, so the idea would be if you were to set a higher price, suppose you were to set a price of 300, then the rival now has an incentive to set a price of 299 and capture the market. And they're still making profits, so that's wonderful. But then you realize, oh, you can set a price of 298 and undercut them, and then you capture the market. And but they, th but then they can set a price of 297, and you can set a price of 296, and so on and so forth. When does this undercutting behavior stop? Well, when you hit price equal to marginal cost. Of course, somebody could set price equal to 199, but you both have costs of 200, and so that means that though you're going to capture the entire market, you would be making a loss, and so that wouldn't be a good idea. And so it actually turns out by this logic, we're going to get a Bertrand equilibrium where you're going to be setting price equal to marginal cost. Now, it actually turns out there's an entire family of Nash equilibria in the identical products Bertrand where you have at least two firms setting price equal to marginal cost. There's going to be a whole family of Nash equilibria of that, of that variety. And so it doesn't matter how many firms we have in the market, if two firms are setting price equal to marginal cost, nobody can gain by doing anything else. And so it actually doesn't matter what any of the other firms do as long as you have two setting price equal to marginal cost. Why? Well, the two firms that are setting price equal to marginal cost, nobody has a profitable unilateral deviation, right? If you're setting price equal to marginal cost, your rival can't deviate to go lower because they're going to get, they're going to capture the market, but they'd be making a loss, right? Setting 199 is not a good idea. Or they could go up to one to 200, I mean 201, or something higher. 201 is going to be just as good as a million because you're going to earn zero profits either way because somebody setting price equal to 200 is going to undercut anything higher. And what about everybody else in the market? Well, they're earning zero, and they'd be earning zero if they were to set price equal to 200 as well because at price equal to marginal cost, we'd assume zero economic profits in the... Uh, in, in the game. And so everyone earns zero profits regardless of what they do as long as two people are setting price equal to marginal cost. So this gives rise to what's called the Bertrand paradox because you get the perfect competition outcome without uh, with only two firms. And usually we think of markets becoming more competitive as you add additional firms. Actually in this, mar in this market or in this case, as long as you have two firms setting price equal to marginal cost, doesn't matter if you add like an unlimited number of firms, the price is going to, the market's going to remain at this equilibrium. Okay, so this is kind of, it's kind of cool, straightforward. Let's make sure that your logic is, uh, is, is clear and correct here. So let's see what happens if the marginal costs differ. All right, so suppose we have one firm with a marginal cost equal to 200, another firm with a marginal cost equal to 300. What do they do? Well, in equilibrium, we assume that firm one is going to set whatever is the highest price they can possibly set and still undercut firm two, right? So firm one, they're going to set a price of 299.99 or whatever, you know, assuming, so we have, so this is dollars and cents, $299.99 would actually be the equilibrium. Here, I'm just using integers, so I'll say the equilibrium would be 299. The basic idea is you're going to set the largest amount that you can set to still undercut this other, this other rival. Why not set price equal to 200? Well, there's no reason to, right? So anything below 300 is going to capture the market for firm one. Firm one's a monopolist at anything below 300, right? 
And so there's no need to set anything lower. Firm 2 is going to be undercut by 299 and Firm 1 would become a monopolist. So Firm 1 never sets price as low as 200. Why? Because there's no downward pressure in terms of price competition forcing that to happen, right? Why did that happen here? Well, here they both had marginal cost of 200. So both of them could continue fighting uh, this price war down to price equal to marginal cost of 200. Right here, price never actually gets below uh, or doesn't actually get down to firm one's marginal cost because after it gets below firm two's marginal cost, there's no more any there's no longer any downward pressure on price. And so the equilibria that we'd expect here would be firm one prices as high as it can while remaining a monopolist while undercutting firm two. So, and then you can clearly that's a Nash equilibria, right? Firm one can't gain by deviating. If they price a little bit higher, they tie, and then they split the market with firm uh, with firm two. If they price lower, well, then they're just leaving money on the table. So, of course, firm two is firm one's going to price as high as they can to still undercut firm two, and that would be Arbitrand equilibrium in this case.